to be invited to speak for our senior students. So when I was uh, invited by Dr. Dino to have this talk, actually I am quite ambivalent to accept it because talking about yourself is really quite a daunting task. Uh, it's really out of character when it comes it's really out of character for me to talk about myself. Anyway, I would want to inspire our Lady of Fatima University nursing students to dream big and to do everything that they could to achieve those dreams. So I will start with uh, this presentation by introducing you to a little girl, a little girl who was dreaming of becoming a broadcast journalist when she grows up. So it was her dream to become a broadcast journalist and she decided that she wanted to achieve that dream during the time that she was in fourth grade or I, I think she was 10 years old. However, a lot of things happened along the way and because of influences of relatives like Titas, who are working as nurses in the United States, uh, she decided to take up nursing and she did enroll in Our Lady of Fatima University. And during the time, it was still known as Our Lady of Fatima College. So what you can see now in your screen uh, are pictures of my batchmates. You will see Sir Vasquez at the, in one of the pictures and that picture on top, pinicturean pa namin yan sa isang developed or printed na, uh, we don't normally print pictures anymore, but that is a printed picture of me and my group mates. So we were taking up psychiatric nursing and I'm sure you did, uh, you also experienced uh, projects like this one. Our professor then was Mam Aida Bautista, and she normally uh, she normally give project wherein you have to do role play and drama, and that is the reason behind that picture. So, as a nursing student, uh, I'm an ordinary nursing student, but basically it was during my exposure in. Uh, National Center for Mental Health that I realized that nursing is really a worthwhile course. And maybe there is a possibility that I am going to, and uh, that little girl is going to enjoy the course. Because basically, basically the reason why she did enroll in nursing was that she was thinking that it could be a stepping stone for her other dream, which is also becoming a doctor. Or maybe after several semesters of trying nursing, uh, her mother and her relatives will allow her eventually to shift to another course, which is broadcast journalism. However, in 2004, she was able to finish the course and she took the board exam the same year and luckily she passed and she did apply to several institutions. So the little girl who was, become, uh, who was dreaming of becoming a broadcast journalist uh, applied uh, uh, at Philippine Heart Center and National Children, uh, what's the, the name of that hospital? National Children's Hospital. So those are the only two hospitals where I, where the little girl decided that she wanted to work. So after submitting her CVs to Philippine Heart Centers, she went to National Children's Hospital, um, submitted her CV, and then when she get out of the hospital, she noticed another building, which is just a walking distance from NCH. And she realized, I have an extra copy of my CV. Might as well submit also this CV to St. Luke's Medical Center. So I went to St. Luke's and it was St. Luke's who, well, the first one who invited me to have an interview and luckily I was admitted in the St. Luke's uh, nursing staff effectiveness training program. So this is in year 2004. Before you become a uh, staff at St. Luke's Medical Center, you have to undergo a training program, which I think 
I, I could I'm not sure uh, if I got this right. I think it's uh, you have to do it for two months and then afterwards you are going to be assigned uh, to a certain unit. I really wanted to be assigned in the operating room, but then fate, I think, uh, decided that I should be somewhere else. So while I, I was at St. Luke's, I was assigned at the neurocritical care unit and epilepsy monitoring unit. So I was a staff nurse at St. Luke's Medical Center for almost three years. So these are basically the things that we are doing. So, so neurocritical care unit is an intensive care unit, but basically it focuses on patients whose condition have something to do with the central and peripheral nervous system, like traumatic brain injury, cerebrovascular accident, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So those specific type of conditions, and normally the procedures that we do would be Glasgow coma scale scaring every hour for eight hours for five days in a week, all days in the year. And then we also do intraventricular monitoring. This is something that you are going to talk about uh, in acute biologic crisis. And also what you see on the top uh, left part of your screen is EEG or electroencephalography. This is the one that we are doing in the epilepsy monitoring unit. So what I learned at St. Luke's Medical Center are so many skills, so many standard procedures. Uh, in a way, you also learn a hospital, a hospital procedure, hospital supplies or medical supplies that you have not seen before. And I think uh, one value that I can share uh, with regards to my exposure or the little girl's exposure at St. Luke's Medical Center would be the importance of adjustment. Uh, being able to adjust with different types of people from all walks of life, uh, doctors, relatives, uh, patients themselves, even foreigners. So learning how to adjust is one value that I have learned. And also I can say that, well, I can say that after being exposed to several hospitals, I can say that uh, Filipinos are lucky that they have St. Louis because <laughs> I can tell that it's really one of the world's best. So yeah, so these are uh, pictures of me and my fellow St. Luke's nurses while we were in the neurocritical care unit. So please don't think that all we do is, yeah, take pictures. Uh, so during that time, it was newly renovated. So we were able to lie down on the floor and do uh, stuff like that as a way of distressing ourselves. Now, while I was in St. Luke's, on my third year at St. Luke's, my manager asked me to join the mentors of the nursing staff effectiveness training program. So she invited me to talk uh, in one of the sessions. And as I was talking in one of the sessions, that's when I realized that I wanted to become a teacher. So... Number six, all right, right, number six. Here, six, right, number six, six. Hello? Oh, oh, who is your good friend? The good Hello? friend. My good friend is. Uh, who? At Ate Shamila lang lagay mo. What's that? Ate Shamila, your cousin. My cousin, Ate Shamila. Camille, can you? Give me Shamel. Shamel, give me Shamel. Camille, can you turn uh, off your mute, uh, no, please? Camille. Multitasking. Just like me. <laughs> okay, so let us proceed. 
So, yeah, so the value that I have learned as I work uh, at St. Jacob's Medical Center is adjustment. During that time, we were just earning probably 2,000 to 3,000 every two weeks. And every time I will earn, say, 3,500 in two weeks, feeling ko ang yaman yaman ko na ang dami-dami na ng pera. Okay, so those are uh, examples of how nurses would really be, uh, those are examples of experiences that you are going to face after you finish your nursing education. So when I decided that I wanted to become a teacher, uh, I, I have applied in so many universities and MCU, FEU, CEU, PLM, and Early de Fatima University. Uh, luckily, I was able to be accepted in all those institutions, but I decided that I wanted to go back to Fatima and share everything that I have learned at St. Luke's to the future nurse, uh, how shall I say this, to the future nurses, which are Fatima made. So initially, I, I was assigned at the virtual laboratory as an instructor during the time of uh, virtual laboratory was still in the San Lorenzo Hall. It's not yet in the Rice Tower uh, as compared to the, yes, virtual laboratory that you are, oh yeah, that you have been attending to before this uh, COVID pandemic. Okay, so I was handling HAL, the simulator, and normally I handle case scenario like myocardial infarction and GBS. So those are conditions that I have normally encountered during the time that I was working in the intensive care unit of St. Luke's Medical Center. Also, I was given the opportunity to teach the following subjects. I think I taught bioethics during summer. I enjoyed that a lot. I also teach uh, fundamentals of nursing for CA1 and CA2. And my two most uh, favorite uh, subjects that I taught would be acute biologic crisis and, of course, uh, nursing research. So during the time that I was uh, at Our Lady of Fatima University, I think a uh, lesson that I have learned is that hard work and abilities are rewarded if you use them appropriately. So if uh, masipag ka and mahusay kang makisama at uh, marunong kang mapagku, ma marunong kang ma ng humility, your uh, abilities are going to be rewarded. So yeah, that's us uh, with uh, Dean Santos at the center. So I also used to be the mascot. Yun yung term ni Dr. Dino. I also used to be the mascot of the College of Nursing. Okay, so this is probably, uh, I could say, the highlight of my nursing career was the decade that I was in Our Lady of Fatima University. So I stayed in Fatima from 2007 till Oh, that's a typo typographical error. My apologies. From 2007 to 2016. So I was a College of Nursing faculty those entire nine years. And I was also given the opportunity to be the nursing research coordinator for a year from 2011 to 2012. I am going to share with you some uh, pictures uh, which highlights of course, the activities and the experiences that I've had with Fatima. So these, binilin po kasi ng ating level coordinator na dapat may evidences, maraming pictures. So the picture on the upper left of your screen, that is uh, one of my favorite pictures because it, uh, it shows the four nursing research coordinators of the College of Nursing. So the first nursing research coordinator of the new College of Nursing Research Department is Dr. Michael Joseph Dino. And then when he became a uh, director or assistant director of the RDIC, uh, 
I was assigned as the nursing research coordinator. I was followed by Clarence John Concepcion, the guy in red. And of course, you now have your research awardee and ever talented Ms. Sharon Mulaga Kahayon. So during the time that I was handling the nursing research coordinator post, uh, we have sent lots of students uh, into conferences competing against other schools. And I could say that F Fatima nursing students are way ahead when it comes to research abilities as compared to other students of local nursing school in the Philippines. So that's uh, the picture um, at the bottom left is uh, one of the research groups who had their uh, final research defense inside the former RDIC office. And this picture is, I think this was taken in Japan when uh, Mr. Dino and I presented uh, research in a conference there. During the time that I was uh, in Fatima between 2007 and 2017, I was able to finish my Master of Arts in Nursing degree. And you can see there uh, Dr. Fred Ruiz. He was my research advisor. And with the master's thesis that I was able to finish, I was also given the opportunity to present those uh, that specific paper to conferences, local conferences in the Philippines. It was also during my uh, tenure at Fatima that I became an AHA provider and tutor. And another highlight of my employment at, at Fatima was my being a member of the Research Development and Innovation Center. So I was the RDIC Assistant Director and IERC Chair from 2014 to 2017. So this is the time my exposure here or the work that I've done in RDIC has further, how, how shall I say this? It, it made me realize that I really have a passion for finding questions to import, uh, finding answers to important questions. So this is when I truly appreciate research, not just nursing research, but research, uh, ethics that has to be followed in doing research. So that's really my passion, which I continuously carried up to this point. So these are pictures that I had with the uh, RDC staff. And of course, uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Dino and I are, I think, very proud of was the creation of the Institutional Review Board of the RDIC of Our Lady of Fatima University. So this uh, RDIC is giving opportunities to students to be able to harness their talents when it comes to research. So we do that by bringing them to several conferences. Research, I could say, has brought me to places that I wouldn't uh, let's face it, there are places that I wouldn't bother visiting, but I had to visit because of research. But research has also brought me to places that I have never imagined I'll be able to visit. So uh, research has brought me to Cebu several times, Palawan, Davao, Cagayan de Oro, and believe it or not, I've even, uh, we've even visited uh, far flung provinces like Sultan Pudarat, South Cotabato, and General Santos. So here we are with other faculty of the College of Nursing. You will see there Mangkahayol and Sir Ben Camino, and that's me. So that is one of our initial exposure in research when we attended a conference in Baguio. And then we came back to Baguio with our students. And the topmost picture is when we won all the awards in the Philippine Nursing Research Society in one of their conferences, and that's in Cebu. And the one, the picture on your right is the nursing faculty 
from all three campuses in a nursing conference in Iloilo. Apart from being able to travel the Philippines, research has also gave me the opportunity has also given me the opportunity to visit other countries like Indonesia, Japan, Macau, Hong Kong, and China. Actually, there are so many opportunities that are available if you are doing research. Minsan nga, uh, ang daming pwedeng puntahan, sobrang daming pwedeng puntahan, ikaw na yung tatanggi. And so, this is uh, one way, this is my way of encouraging you to Yes, harness your research talents or your research skills, or if you don't have the skill, make sure that you start developing them because research, I could say, can bring you anywhere. It's also during uh, the time that I was with uh, the College of Nursing and RDIC that I decided to further my education. So from 2015 to 2017, I took up Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing at the University of the Philippines in Manila. So this is uh, uh, one of probably the most challenging time of my education. It was really hard work to do assignments and how to prepare for lessons but I could definitely say that my training at uh, UP Manila College of Nursing has helped me a lot in my present employment here overseas. So while I was doing all those things or while the little girl was doing all of those things, teaching, doing research and uh, being a student uh, in a university, uh, he, she also dreamt of going someplace where she could practice her nursing profession. I think you agree with me, and I think uh, most nurses would agree with me that there will come a point in your life wherein you are going to ask whether it is right to try something new and to probably push yourself to, to push yourself to your whichever limit that you think you could handle so in 2016 i decided that i would want to further my education and the countries that i have chosen is new zealand because of several reasons but i think the primary reason would be the the reality that based on things that i have researched it's one of the best places to raise your children so in 2017 yep 2017 i entered new zealand under student visa so I did a postgraduate course here. So this is our campus during the spring. So you will see the cherry block. This is Eastern Institute of Technology. It is located in the Eastern coast of New Zealand. So in here, I took up postgraduate diploma in health science. It is a research course, uh, 120 unit course. I was able to have my master's degree in the Philippines cross-credited. That's why I was able to finish early. So that's me with other international students in one of the programs in the polytechnic. So yeah, so you can see that my passion really is apart from teaching is learning. I consider myself a lifelong learner. So these pictures were taken during our graduation. So even though I have a postgraduate degree already, uh, if you are a nurse from another country, but you are qualified, so in New Zealand, they will call you internationally qualified nurse. 
even though you are qualified and even though I have a postgraduate degree, I had to undergo a course. Sa Pilipinas, uh, ang tawag natin doon, bridging course. But they call it here as CAP. It's the Competency Assessment Program. So it's a six-week course that will allow you to study the health system of New Zealand. Because even though you are a registered nurse and probably you've been working for 10 years at sobrang galing mo, I could definitely say that health systems in different country differs extensively. So iba, ibang iba ang health system ng iba't ibang bansa. That's why I had to undergo the competency assessment program. So as you can see, the virtual or the laboratory of Our Lady of Fatima University, the ones that you are experiencing there in Manila, is similar or at par at uh, laboratories that they have here in developed countries like New Zealand. So you will also notice that most of my classmates in the CAP program are Filipinos. I was told that before, majority of students were from India. Pero ngayon daw, mas madami na yung mga Pinoy kasi uh, mas madaling na-approve yung application ng mga Pinoy to take up CAP kasi magaling daw kayong magsalita ng English. Okay, so one of the requirements is you must have an IELTS score of 7. So during that time, most of us were Filipinos because, yeah, I was told that nurses from India are having a hard time to pass, they are having a hard time passing their IELTS. So once you become a nurse in New Zealand, so you are going to receive that badge. So that badge is... Uh, well, testament of your education and hard work. So once I became registered, uh, the first work that I have I had here was a registered nurse in the hospital wing of an elderly facility. So sa Philippines, ang tawag natin doon, nursing homes. But yes, in the Philippines, wala masyadong nursing homes because it is part of our culture wherein we look after the elderly. So yung mga lolo lola natin, we look after them. But once you are exposed uh, to the culture of other countries, particularly say US, here, Canada, Australia, in the UK, uh, nagkalat ang mga nursing homes because it's not a uh, part of their culture for children to look after their parents or their grandparents. So you put them in homes, and homes could be a residential care. The, those are for elderly who are independent or do not need support with their activities of daily living. And it also has a hospital level of care, meaning these are elderly which are requiring more support, and they also have dementia wing. So, of course, we know that as uh, as we grow older, the possibility that an elderly is going to have a cognitive impairment like dementia or Alzheimer increases as well. So, in here, uh, one of the main prob uh, problems is that we normally encounter what would be false. That's why later on I am going to talk about false assessment. So while I was in uh, elderly facility, uh, that's I realized that matanda na ako para sa physical work, and I really miss teaching. So I applied for a teaching position, and at present. I am now uh, teaching uh, nursing students at Southern Institute of Technology. So SIT is located at the southernmost part of uh, New Zealand. Kumbaga sa Philippines, para siyang holo. Okay, so nasa Mindanao area ko ng New Zealand. It is in this city. This, uh, this uh, uh, polytechnic is in Invercargill 
uh, this is where you can find the most southern, how shall we say that? Uh, the southernmost Starbucks in the world. Okay, so ito yung pinakadulong. Nandito yung pinakadulong Starbucks. So the problem here is that it's too cold. Okay, the weather is too cold for my liking. So that's the number one challenge. So at SIT, I am uh, teaching postgraduate, uh, postgraduate student, Bachelor of Science in nursing students and they also have here the yeah your what we called enrolled nursing so enrolled nurses are also professional nurses but there are some limitations with regards to the things that they can do so normally registered nurses will just delegate tasks to enrolled nurses so i am just going to share with you one of the technology one of the technologies that we are using here at SIT. Uh, this is one advancement that I have seen here, but pretty much everything that you have at Fatima is also here. So I could say that Our Lady of Fatima University or College of Nursing is providing you with top of the line technologies when it comes to, of course, uh, when it comes to devices, equipments that could help you to have quality education. Hello, this is Dwight for our entire undergraduate and postgraduate education. Um, it is a holographic image. Um, and mixed reality, so just so you can see the, the um, that's my immediate superior. But they can also mm -hmm. see the external environment. So, everything from anatomy, where students can learn about the VR right through to different patient scenarios where we can bring a condition to life in the form of a real person that they can sit in a classroom and walk from through six feet around and observe. So, hollow patient means that we've got. A patient is experiencing some sort of health crisis. So that could be everything from domestic violence right through to stroke or myocardial infarction. We place that person in the room and the students see the room just as it is, and then they can walk around with the patient and they watch a 15 second loop of the different scenarios, assess, stop, ask questions, and then we exacerbate that condition. The hollow human is anatomy. So that's the chance for a student to look at everything from a skeleton right through to observing parts of the human system. So the DI tract, the dentro-urinary tract, all of those different things. I think has to prove the way that um, it's definitely um, giving me a special learner um, more responsibility, more to be able to see and, and to, to interact with. And I, I think it has been my learning. So visuals are really good. Um, they're easier to be used and maneuver around in the room and um, very realistic looking too. They're really excited and they're really positive about what they're saying. They always get a little bit on and actually see a real life person or the different structures within the body. And so they're really excited to get them out and use them and ask for it more and more. Because we have hollow beings, it really has enhanced students' clinical thinking because they can see a realistic image, they can see a deterioration, and then we can really, really transfer that knowledge from book through practice in a safe and clinical environment and improve the outcomes for the students as well. Oh, I'd love to see more more things like this, more augmented reality, more um, um, bringing the, the clinical environment closer to us as students so that we can learn um, things that are closer to what we'd be experiencing in our world. I think technology internationally is changing and to keep up with what is happening internationally and technology is at least, um, it was a really good investment and the students really, really enjoy it. It's really revolutionised the nursing education that we can currently do.
So as I am doing teaching here at SIT, there are times when I have nothing to do that I am thinking whether I have made the right decision of taking up nursing despite the fact that I wanted to become some, someone something else. Me wanting to become a broadcast journalist, but fate has led me to take up nursing. So every time I think about it, I realize that I do not want to become a broadcast journalist anymore because being a nurse has uh, made me into a well-rounded person. It has given me the opportunity to become, uh, I, I call this three in one. I am now a researcher, a nurse, and a teacher. So broadcast journalist does research or investigate and present news and current affairs contents for TV. But as a nurse, I can also do research. I can also do, I can also investigate, and I can also present this investigation to my students. Maybe not in television or in radio, but everything that I have learned, everything that I have researched on, I can share this information to nursing students and present them in a way that it is balanced, accurate, and interesting. And apart from uh, being a researcher, a nurse, and a teacher, I could say that being a nurse has also taught me to be, uh, I don't know what descriptor to use, but I think it has helped me in my most important role as a mother. So you will see here in your screen are the three uh, boys that I am raising and hopefully uh, this uh, short talk, I just wing the talk. So anyway, hopefully it has uh, inspired you in a way that uh, I know that most of you did not choose nursing as a course. It is not something that you really wanted. But if you are going to have the mindset that uh, you are how shall I say, you are blessed and you are lucky to be doing this thing because nursing is rewarding. And I will also say that out of all the hard work that you are doing, it's also important to distress and give time for yourself. So yeah, this is me. This is me being an apolog an apolog an apologetically me. Uh, so yeah, so I will end probably with uh, this uh, rem uh, reminder from Brian Tracy. He said that you have to commit yourself to lifelong learning because the most valuable asset you will ever have is your mind and what you put into it. So this, uh, this uh, is Queenstown, New Zealand. And I can probably say that I am the one who took that photo. So it is uh, my dream for all of you to dream high, dream big, and hopefully you do everything that you could to achieve your dream. So Dino, can we have a five minute break so they can stretch their legs? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, or probably two or three minutes break just so you can stretch your legs or drink water or have a bladder break. Like what I have mentioned, as I was uh, doing nursing in an elderly facility here in New Zealand, one of the common problems that we normally have as registered nurses is the increasing falls uh statistics that is happening i think it's not just happening here in new zealand but all over the world so this is a session on false risk assessment probably you are thinking that this is a session which is very basic very fundamentals especially for i think third year and fourth year students like yourselves but just like what I normally say every time I am conducting reviews for CA1 and CA2 and my subject is fundamentals of nursing. After all the knowledge that you have gained all throughout your nursing education, and dami-dami ng alam, 
sobrang advanced na nung alam nyo, minsan, you tend to overlook those information which are fundamentals, which are basic, when in fact, they are the ones which are very important because without those fundamentals, you will not be able to think critically and respond correctly every time there is going to be a specific health condition that you are going to encounter. So this specific session will be focusing on falls and falls risk assessment. So yeah, nowadays we can say that life expectancy is, is steadily increasing. At present, it is around, the average is around 67.7 years. Of course, different countries differ when it comes to life expectancy. Uh, obviously, those uh, people living in more developed countries have higher life expectancy. Like here in New Zealand, life expectancy for girls or for female is around 74. And in the Philippines, it's just 67. So you imagine the gap, but pretty much, even though there is a gap worldwide, there is a trend of increasing life expectancy. So apart from that, there is also a dr drastic increase in the population. And 80% of those are in the developing countries. It is even projected but that by the year 2040, there are going to be around 22 million elderly. Now, this is a good thing. Increasing life expectancy is, I could say, one of the most significant triumphs of the modern world today. Siyempre, masaya tayo, or we feel successful kung yung mga elderly or yung uh, mga citizens natin ay tumatanda at humahaba ang buhay. However, we have to realize the reality that just because they are living longer does not mean that they are living healthier. Most of them will not enjoy quality of life because they are going to have chronic diseases as they age. So one of the main concerns or problems that the elderly population or the growing elderly population is facing is of course their uh, how shall I say this is their exposure or possibly the chance that they are going to have a fall. So annually it is said that 30 to 40 percent of people aged 65 years old and above who lived in the community are going to have a fall. This is according to the Center for Disease Control in 2016. Actually, they said that in the United States alone, one in every four adults over the age of 65 is going to experience falls. And in the U.S. alone, and for the year 2014, they were able to report 29 million falls. So now, every time an elderly is going to have a fall, well, 50% of that injury is serious. Or 50% of that fall will result to injury. And out of that 50% uh, injury, 10% will be considered serious. So Injury could be minor ones, it could be just bruises or sprains or skin tears, but it could also be major. Example of major injury would be your broken bones, a hip injury, and a wrist injury. So falls can cause serious death. It can even can, it can uh, result in a serious injury. And of course, it is going to have an impact on the quality of life of our elderly. Fall injuries are the most common cause of traumatic brain injuries. And more than 95% of hip fractures are caused by falling. That's why fall prevention is very important. Fall is believed to be the number one cause 
of injury related deaths and because of this our government is also spending a lot of money to address this problem so the annual direct medical cost for falls is estimated to be 50 billion dollars so i am going to show you a startling statistics it is said that for every 11 seconds, an elderly is treated in an emergency department for a fall. Every one second, an older adult will experience a fall. And every 19 minutes, an older adult dies as a result of a fall. So this is sad and this is incomprehensible. Imagine, as we talk right now, maybe someone somewhere in the world is dying because of fall or has experienced a fall and most of the time after that uh, experience their lives are, no, are never are not going to be the same again so what is a fall so by definition it is coming to rest unintentionally on the ground or lower level not due to an acute overwhelming event like stroke seizure or loss of consciousness or external event to which any person would be susceptible so falls are one of the major threats to the quality of life of our elderly normally it causes a decline in self-care ability and participation in physical and social activities so minsan after a fall experience, yung mga elderly natin na dating lumalabas, matatakot ng lumabas, ayaw ng mamalengke, ayaw ng pumunta sa kapitbahay para makapagkwentuhan or maybe maglaro ng bingo. So technically, they are going to have a fear of falling. And this normally happens to more than 40% of elderly people who has experienced a fall. So this will further limit their activity and of course, it will also limit their socialization. So since fall is a major problem, it is identified that nurses can help in preventing this, uh, preventing the further increase of this startling statistics. So one of the things that nurses should be an expert at is assessment. So there are several false risk assessment that are available today, but this is the one that I have chosen because I think this is also the one that your director would, uh, that your level coordinator would appreciate. Okay, so this false risk assessment tool is from the Johns Hopkins organization. So this is called the JH FRAT or the Johns Hopkins Fall Risk Assessment Tool. So it is an evidence-based fall safety initiative from Johns Hopkins. So it is a risk stratification tool which they claim to be highly effective when combined with comprehensive protocol. So normally, if you are an institution who are catering for elderly residents, you have to have a tool that will assess every single elderly that you are going to admit in your institution. And then after you have assessed them, it is important that you have a protocol on what to do. Example, they are high false risk or say moderate false risk. You should have an algorithm that every staff in the facility has to follow to make sure that falls are not going to happen. So according to Johns Hopkins, this uh, specific tool when combined with a comprehensive protocol and fall prevention products and technology will be beneficial for hospitals and institution. How is this going to be beneficial? Just by accomplishing this tool and by comprehensively following the algorithm of your organization, it can reduce fall rates, it can reduce fall injury rates, and then of course, it improves hospital and patient safety. And the John Hopkins Hospital claimed that this 
a specific tool was able to reduce their fall rate by 21% and fall injury rate by 51%. So if we are going to magnify the tool, it's like that. So you can look at the right side of your screen. So it says there, if patient has any of the following conditions, check the box and apply fall risk intervention as indicated. So this uh, FRAT from Johns Hopkins has two versions, one for acute care and the other one is for home health care. So the main difference will just be the second box under high falls risk wherein you will see patient has experienced a fall during this hospitalization. So, syempre, kung nasa home health tayo, kung nasa community, that specific statement will not be written in the tool. So, tignan nyo yung nandoon sa yellow na box at the bottom part. Sabi dyan, select, uh, sorry, uh, yung statement before the yellow box. Sabi dyan, do not continue with fall risk score calculation if any of the above conditions are checked. So technically, kung ang pasyente o ang residente ay nagkaroon ng one fall within six months before hospitalization, fall during this hospitalization or high fall risk per protocol, or is completely paralyzed or completely immobilized, that specific person will already be considered under false risk. So you do not need to continue the calculation anymore. You only have to do the calculation for documentation purposes. But say a specific patient does not have any of the above criteria, so you are going to continue your assessment. Now let's look at the false risk. Why do you think previous false risk is important in determining the possibility that an elderly is going to have a fall. Actually, it is said that the strongest single predictor of future falls is a history of previous fall. Kung ang matanda ay nadulas na, nahulog sa bed, or maybe nadulas sa banyo, it is uh, already a risk factor or, or a predictor that that elderly is going to have another fall. Bakit? This is probably because the individual's reason for falling the first time is likely to recur. So that is very important. You ask them during false risk assessment whether recently they have already experienced a fall. Another parameters that you are going to look at are the following, age, fall history, elimination, both bowel and urine, medication, patient care equipment, mobility, and cognition. So you are just going to assign an appropriate po point for each parameter, like with age, 60 to 69, one point, and so on. Now, this is uh, the next uh, column uh, is similar to the one that I have just discussed a while ago. If they had a fall within the six months before this admission, that is five points. If there is incontinence, urgency or frequency or a combination of both, you look at the corresponding points that you are going to put in the column. Medications. This include patient-controlled analgesia, opiates, anticonvulsants, antihypertensive, diuretics, hypnotics, laxatives, sedatives, and psychotropics. Single select, meaning you can only use, uh, you can only select one of those three options. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm, I know na mute kayo, but why do you think medication should be one of the parameters in assessing the fall? Particularly medication that will affect the functioning of the brain and the cardiovascular system. Sige, tiisip. Critically think, bakit? Okay, so probably meron kang answer. And I guess your answer is correct. So, medication has long been known to have side effects that can increase the risk of 
falling, particularly psychotropic medication. So any medication acting on the brain or affecting the functions of the cardiovascular system can increase false risk. Why? So yung mga psychotropic medications natin, like sedative hypnotics, antipsychotics, antidepressants, anticonvulsant, and narcotic pain medication, they increase the risk because I'm sure you know these have an effect on the cognitive function. So they will result to what? Sedation, slower reaction times, and impaired balance. So those three that I have mentioned, sedation, slower reaction time, and impaired balance could potentially result to a fall among our elderly. Patient care equipment, anything that tethers the patient like IV infusion, chest tube, inveling catheters, uh, all of those could also predispose a patient uh, to experience a fall. The latter part, mobility, you also look at that. You select all that apply and you are going to add the points together. So if a specific elderly require assistance or supervision for mobility, transfer or ambulation, you allot two points for that. If she also has unsteady gait, two plus two, that would be four. If the elderly has visual or auditory impairment affecting mobility, that's another two. So highest possible score for this is six and the lowest possible score is zero. You also have to look at the cognition, whether there is alteration in the awareness of immediate physical environment, whether there is a behavior of being impulsive, or whether there is a lack of understanding of one's physical and cognitive limitations. Again, you can choose uh, several of this and you just add the points. So after you have allotted uh, the points, you are going to add all the scores. If that specific resident has 6 to 13 uh, points, meaning you are going to assign him or her under moderate false risk. Okay, so C, resident is under moderate false risk. However, if the score is more than 13, oopsie, that's a typographical error. You look at the uh, yellow box just above it, if it is more than 13, th uh, that resident is considered high false risk. Okay, so actually it's very easy. Ang tricky dito is yung iyong assessment. Okay, so ang gagamitin mo dito is your clinical eye as to what is the right score that you are going to allot for your patient. I'm sure addition madali, kaya ka nag-nursing kasi magaling ka sa mathematics. Age is easy, history is easy, but all other parameters here would require your clinical eye and critical thinking. So let's try. So I have your case study. Please grab or at least attempt to grab a paper and a pencil so that you can use the assessment tool. <coughs> Excuse me. So our case is Mrs. A. She is a 78-year-old 70, wife of a farmer that recently moved to your facility. Okay, so let's say you are a New Zealand registered nurse and you are working in an elderly facility. <coughs> she has Alzheimer's and is visited by her husband often. Her medical history shows hypertension, arthritis, Alzheimer's, and urinary frequency. Her medications are lisonipril, hydrochlorothiazide, and seroquel. She has had issues of stability and she falls frequently. The most recent one was three weeks ago. Her husband is unable to care for her at home. So normally, that is one of the reasons kung bakit napupunta sila sa rest home. Wala nang mag-aalaga sa kanila and they can no longer uh, independently perform activities of daily living. She was always very well-groomed and kept her home tidy. She wears glasses but not had any vision check in years. She enjoys baking and listening to country music. So that is the same case study. So pretty much, if you're going to look at the upper part of the tool, pasok na siya dyan. Meron na siyang 
history of more than one fall within six months before admission. So automatically, you are going to put the patient under high falls risk precaution. Okay? But of course, for learning and documentation processes, we still have to accomplish the score calculation. So how old is Mrs. A? She is 78 years old. So what point are you going to allot? Two points. Two points. Very good. Okay. Kakasagot pala kayo. Okay, so fall history. Does she have a fall within the six months before admission? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Five, five points. Five All right, points. so what's the five. score that you are going five. to put? Five, five. points. Five. Very good. Let's look at elimination, bowel, and urine. Does she have incontinence, urgency, or frequency? Urgency, frequency, and incontinence. You look at the frequency. Uh, yes, frequency. Two, points. Two, points. Two, points. two points. Two points. All right. Ano ka dyan? Anong sabi? She has what? Urinary. Urinary frequency. Okay. Medication. Oh, by the way, why do you think antihypertensives are included here? Psychotropics are fine. Yes, they affect cognitive function. What about antihypertensives? Why do you think uh, elderly are prone to fall if they are taking antihypertensive? Wag matakot sa magot. Sorry? Hypotension. Okay. Yes, okay. So technically, antihypertensive will have an effect on blood flow. Blood flow. And some antihypertensive will also have an impact on the heart rate. You know that with uh, balance and maintaining an, an upright posture and consciousness, kailangan yun. Upright posture and consciousness are important for a steady gait. If you are hypotensive, or if you are bradycardic, technically, the amount of blood going to the brain is up or down? Up or down? Up, up, up. Down. 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 Down, okay. So there, you are going to have problem with posture and consciousness. That's why antihypertensive medication also predisposes your patients to falls. So ano daw yung gamot niya? Lisinopril? Hydrochlorothiazide and seroquel. Ano ba ang lisinopril? Ano ang lisinopril? ACE inhibitor. So that is your adjutensive conversing enzyme inhibitor. What about your hydrochlorothiazide? Anong action yan? Okay, alam ko nasa isip nyo, nalunig nyo si Mama Roma, that is a loop, diuretics. <laughs> and seroquel. Okay. Ano anak, ang seroquel, sabi ni Mama Ida Bautista? Nakalimutan nyo na kung ano ang function ng seroquel. Okay, so it's one of your psychotropic medication. So what is the point that you are going to give to this patient? Five. 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 Ay, nilagay ko, oh. Tingnan mo, nilagay ko, ay. <laughs> okay, so that's a typographical error again. My apologies. So this is what? Five points. Five Our points. patient has three. Yeah, it's five. That's a mistake. Our patient has three medications. Three yep. So on two or three uh, medications, so ano dapat dyan? Five points. Okay. Patient care equipment. Any equipment that the patient has? 
What's the score that you are going to allot? If no option is selected, score for category is zero. 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 Okay, zero. What about mobility? Standing Does she require yeah. assistance as of the present? Does she require assistance? No. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so require assistance. assistance. Two points. Sabi ka, you can select a lot, you can select multiple, and then you add the visual, ma'am. 2 plus 2 select plus 2, all. 6. 6, ma'am. 6 yeah. points. So she has 6, six points. Okay. 6 points. What about in cognition? Is there alteration in awareness? Yes. Meron ba? Sinabi na ba dyan? Na, uh, lack of understanding. Okay, meron pa siyang issue when it comes to impulsive behavior? No. Not mentioned? None. Does she have a lack None of understanding? Po. Of course, so, physical and cognitive Zero. Yes, ma'am. Because it's a zero okay. quill. So, so, hey? Sorry? Because of the Seroquel, that's a antipsychotic. Okay. So because of the Seroquel, there could be what? Okay, you have to understand that not all people who are receiving Seroquel have, have mental disorder. Sometimes residents are giving Seroquel so that they are less anxious and they have good sleep. But this, it does not mean that they have cognitive impairment. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's when this specific tool becomes tricky. That's why mm -hmm. you really have to know the patient every time you are going to accomplish the tool. So in this specific case, it's still not mentioned whether she has a problem with uh, cognition. So for this specific uh, parameter, zero. we are going to put zero. zero. So it's zero. two yeah. for age. Fall history is 5, yeah. elimination is 2, medication is 5, five. patient care equipment is 0, zero. mobility is 6, six. Six. and cognition is 0. zero. Yeah. So what is the total score? 20. 20. 20. Huh? 20. 20. 20. Okay, so 2 plus 5 plus 2. Plus 5 plus, plus 6 plus equals 20. 20. So what Seven. now is so what high now followers. is the category of our patient? High following. High following. Okay, tignan mo. 13 lang ako. Oh, kasi nagkamali ako nung lagay. Dito multiple select pala yun. Okay. So if your patient is on high false risk, what now can be done? So nurse, what are you going to do? So there are two major things that you can do. And of course, that has something to do with pulse, prevention, and bone health. How do you think you can aid in preventing the fall? Increase. Increase what? Raise the side raise. Mm -hmm. What if, oh, okay, this is, uh, actually guys, uh, dito sa New Zealand, bawal mag-raise uh, mag ng side rails. Ay ma'am. Hindi mo siya basa, basa gagawin unless meron na kayong kontrata na pumapayag yung pasyente at yung pamilya niya na pwedeng i-raise yung side rails. Because they said that is a form of quote unquote imprisonment and that you are limiting the movement of the health consumer or the patient. So you see, there are certain practices that you are doing in the in some countries which are not acceptable and which are not allowed in other countries. That's why 
kahit sobrang galing ng mga Filipino nurses, it's really important that they undergo uh, several courses para mag-qualify to work in other places. But I could say na lahat ng nurses na na-encounter ko, lahat sila ay believe na believe sa mga Filipino nurses. Okay, but yeah. Ang lagi nung narating ko, but yeah. Technically, you cannot just say raise the side rails to prevent the falls. Falls prevention, do you think it's important for capable elderly to be uh, enrolled, say, in a strength and balance program? Yes or no? Yes. So good naman. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, okay. yes ma'am. What else? What yes, needs po. to be reviewed? Yes, what needs to be reviewed among the elderly? Mm. Is it important to review their medication? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma yes. Yes, ma yes, medication yes, review is very important. As much as possible, you taper the dose uh, slowly if you think that the elderly does not need it anymore. Because very common, anong napansin nyo sa mga matatanda sa bilang ng gamot nila? Ali, Super dami po. Parang, more than one. Sobrang more than dami. Yes, elderly are, it, it seems na kapag elderly ka, there is this issue that we call polypharmacy. If you are taking three to five, more than three medication at a single time. And we know that, uh, of course, because of the physiological changes that the elderly are experiencing, particularly with their uh, hepatic and renal function, yung response ng katawan ng matanda sa gamot ay iba na. Okay? So it is important that medication review is done ever so often to ensure that they are not receiving medications that they do not need, especially if this medication predisposes them to falls. Apart from that, is annual eye checkup important? Yes, very yes, important because vision yes, is important for steady gait. And then, home safety. Karamihan sa mga matatanda sa Pilipinas, sa bahay naman sila nagudulas. Tama ba? Dahil lagi lang silang nasa bahay. Sige nga, bigyan nyo ako ng uh, way kung paano natin ma-ensure ang safety ng matatanda sa loob ng bahay. Ma'am, sa CR po, um, dapat po may yes. mga, sa in comfort rooms, ma'am, there should be yung anti-slippery mat. Anti-slip mat? Very yes, good. Ma Or handrails, ma'am. Yes, handrails. Yes, okay. What else? What about with regards to lighting? Bukas dapat lagi ilaw, ma'am. Okay, okay. So, kung medyo nakakaluwag-luwag, nakakaangat, kahit gabi, wag patayan ng ilaw. O kaya, merong mga ilaw sa wall, okay, na pwede nating iwan bukas para pag bumabangon yung ating mga kasamang elderly sa bahay, sila yung mga dalas nang pumunta ng banyo, at least meron silang guide. Okay, what about for bone health? How can we improve bone health? So regular weight bearing exercise. exercises exercise. if they are not contraindicated. Yes. What should the balance? Uh, what should the diet be like? Para for bone health, anong diet dapat? Rich in calcium. Calcium. Very calcium. Calcium. calcium and what vitamin? B. Vitamin B. Vitamin B. D for vitamin dog. 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 dog absorption. Or baboy. Okay, good. Vitamin D. Saan na kukuha ang vitamin D? Uh, sa sunlight. 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 Very good. Sa sun or sa capsule. Okay? But of course, you have to understand that in some countries na sobrang lamig, balang masyadong araw. Example, oh. here in New Zealand, elderly are given vitamin D regularly because even though they are actually very outgoing, lagi silang nasa labas, bihira dito ang sunlight, so they are given vitamin D. And of course, it's very important for you nurses that every time you are doing an assessment on elderly, you ask them whether they have had a fall okay during the past several months 
And of course, you also discuss risk factors with them. Because you agree a fall or single incident of fall can change someone's life. And kapag ang elderly ay nagkaroon ng experience of fall at nagkaroon ng physiological injury, the entire family is going to be affected. Okay? Particularly with the dynamics of Filipino families where uh, children and grandchildren really look up to their or look after their elders. Okay? So, remember half of those people who walked without help before fracturing a hip will no longer be able to walk independently in the year following the fracture. So imagine how that reality is going to change their lives, not just their life, but the life of the people around them. So after this session, you are going to have a self-directed learning session. You will be given a copy of the following, the JH FRAT, both for the home health and acute care settings. And you will be given a number of case studies. Okay. Read and analyze the case studies. Halatang halata na recycled yung aking PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Anyway, so read and analyze the case studies. Accomplish the false risk assessment tool for each case. Apart from that, it is going to help you a lot if you are going to identify and list all the risk factors and beside that, you enumerate the interventions that are appropriate for the health consumer. So the instructions on when to access and submit your work will be available via your Facebook group page. And Dr. Dino told me that it is going to be uploaded via Canvas. I think that is your learning management system. Now, do you have any question? It could be about the pathway of going overseas or about falls. I have a Thank challenge. You. Can you get out of your chair without using your hands? You try it. <laughs> Students, you try it. Ah, okay, because when you do this with the elderly, they are going to have a very hard time. Okay, so maraming salamat po. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, 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 Thank you, po. God bless, po. Thank you. Thank you.